Good morning, church. It's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I know that many of you have been through a lot in the last week. Uh, Some of you have been through quite a bit. I've been in a lot of your homes. I've talked to a lot of you on the phone. And a lot of our members have been in your homes too. And I've probably been through things that you probably would rather me not have been through in some ways, but also on the other hand, uh, one of the things that I I wanted to say is that I appreciate this church so much. Uh, I have seen many of you work so hard this week at trying to touch the lives of your brothers and sisters and trying to help each and every one of them and make sure that they're okay. And that's what this church is about. That's what we're supposed to be about. And so this morning, I want to commend you on that. And those of you who led us in your homes, I commend you on that also, because I know that that's not easy. Um, This morning, I I wanted to offer a prayer also, Uh, one for our community, uh, one for my words this morning, because in some ways I, I have wrestled all night long with this sermon. I have been preaching it, and I'm sure Nancy has felt it all night long also. Uh, I have tossed and turned every time I've woken up, I was preaching this sermon in my head, and so it, it makes me laugh a little bit, but uh, I hope that, that the things that I say to you this morning touch your heart, uh, that uh, they come uh, with mercy and grace and compassion and love uh, from God, and that you see Him working each and every day. Uh, what a blessing it is to be here this morning, though. Uh, I, I have seen so much go on in our community. Uh, streets and streets of people just getting up and doing work. What a blessing that is to see so many people uh, getting up and doing the work. And that's, that's what my lesson's about this morning, is getting up and, and doing the things that we've been called to do and taking steps of faith and taking actions of faith and working Uh, for God's kingdom. And so, uh, let me pray this morning for our community and for the people that are around us and for this church also. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that are here today. And for our brothers and sisters that are a part of this congregation, some of them might not have been able to come this morning. But either way, Father, we pray for a blessing upon this church. We pray that you bless the people that are here with your love and with your kindness and your compassion. And Father, we pray that you use us in these next few months just to touch people's lives, to love on them and and to show them uh, the love that you have for them. Father, I pray that, uh, that you be with each and every one of us. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have lost homes and property and, and physical things. And uh, Father, I, I just pray that you take care of each and every person that's here. I pray that you love on them and that you wrap your loving arms around this community and that you bless each and every person that's around us. Help us to be your hands and your feet that are willing to go out and do the work for your kingdom and to share your love with each and every person that we come in contact with. Father, this morning as I speak, I pray that you be with my words. I pray that you use your spirits in my life to say the right things. And I pray that you touch each person's heart, not not for me and not for Uh, my glorification, but for yours. Father, we love you and thank you for today. Thank you for your son, in Jesus' name, amen. If you would, open up your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. This lesson was planned for a couple of weeks ago, uh, but it has been rewritten several times since then and been rethought on what, what we need to hear and what we need to be thinking about uh, today. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about faith and how that we have a God that we can trust, a God who is there for us 
and who has the capability to do the things that he has promised to do. And so we should put our trust in him and know that he can take care of us, especially in times like today. We have also talked about a journey of faith and how it's important for each and every one of us to, as we go on that journey, to stay faithful to Him. It's, it's not a sprint, but it's a marathon. It's a long period of time where we are striving to do what He requires of us and we are consistently putting our trust in Him and relying on Him. And I think we can use that more than ever right now. But today, I want us to talk about steps of faith. Mark just got done reading to us James chapter 2. And it talks to us about how faith without works is dead. Without us getting up and doing anything, our faith is meaningless. You can claim that you believe in God. You can say that you believe in Him. But unless you're living that life, unless you're getting up and doing the things that He's called you to, your faith is dead. And that's pretty hard to hear, I think. But He calls us to do His will, to do the things that He wants. I, but I think about also 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which I read to you this morning, that says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. And I think about all the passages throughout the Bible that talk about men of faith, women of faith, who stepped up and stepped out when everything around them was saying, this is impossible. There's a wall in front of you. There's a fortified city that can't be taken. But they did it. And they did exactly what God commissioned them to do. And amazing things happened. Because they put their faith in God and they walked by faith and not by sight. I think even about the disciples. When I spoke to you all uh, two weeks ago, I talked about the disciples with the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000, and how they handed out uh, all the bread. They broke the bread and the fish, and they handed it out, and they only had a few. There were five uh, fish, a couple of fish, and five loaves of bread, and then there were uh, just a few fish and and seven loaves of bread, and they were able to feed 5,000 people. Then they were able to feed 4,000 people, but then the disciples get in the boat, and Jesus says, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. And Jesus is talking about their evilness, their misdeeds. And within that, their only thought that they can come, the only conclusion that they can come to is, We've forgotten the bread. But Jesus asks them a very simple question. Do you still not see? Do you still not understand? And he's talking about the spiritual things that are going on around them. Jesus fed from just a few fish, a few loaves of bread, does such amazing things with just such simple things because he is not bound by the laws of physics and science. He's not bound by the things of this world that we look at with our physical eyes and we say, this is impossible, this cannot be, this will not work. But we, but we need to be praying about those things and giving those things to Him and honoring Him with our lives and asking Him for guidance, asking Him for help and not looking at the physical things but looking at the spiritual things that He desires for us to be doing. Because with Him, all things are possible. And anything can be done. I I feel like this week we're going to face a lot of obstacles. And there's going to be a lot of walls in front of us and a lot of barriers that might come in front of us in times where we feel defeated and we break down and we want to quit. But the one thing I want to remind you is that we have a good God who can do so much for us. And He takes care of us and does exactly what He promises, but we need to ask Him for that help. We need to ask Him for that guidance, and we need to place our faith in Him and let Him take care of the things that are going on around us. I saw a couple of illustrations on on what faith is, and I'll share those with you for just a second. One of those uh, was just a a man walking a tightrope. 
He walks across a tight rope with a wheelbarrow, gets across. He walks back across. There's a big crowd, and they all cheer for him. And he then proceeds to say, do you think I could do this with somebody inside the wheelbarrow? The crowd all cheers. But then he asks for a volunteer. Real faith is the person who believes that he can do it and gets in the wheelbarrow, right? When you're willing to take the risk, there's faith. I also saw another one. I really wanted to try this one for a couple of our high school boys, but I felt like it might be inappropriate. Took medical release forms and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, There are a few I could think of that I would like to use, but uh, a guy took a BB gun and a couple of balloons, and uh, he did this in a sermon. I saw this on YouTube, and I I was like, oh, man, Uh, we we could definitely try this, right? And he shoots the, shoots the balloon, it pops, right? That's pretty amazing. Then he asks for a volunteer. And he wants the volunteer to sign this release form. And then he puts the balloon in his mouth and he takes the gun. He never shoots it. Uh, so, uh, but you get the point, right? It's, real faith is when we're w- willing to take the risk, willing to step out and do what we believe. That's what faith is. It's when we're willing to take the steps and say... I believe that God can take care of this. I know He can. He says He, he can. He promises that He can. Now I'm going to put my faith in Him and I'm going to trust that He will take care of this. That's what faith is. And so this morning, that's what I want to share with you. Is that God has called us to take steps of faith. He has called us to be willing to step out and trust in Him and believe in Him. And the story that I thought of more than any other story was Numbers chapter 13. And I think we could go all throughout the Bible and take pictures of this and present it. Uh, it's, it's over and over and over again with people stepping out in faith. But I want us to look at Numbers chapter 13 for today. And I want us to, to look at what took place here. This is the time where the Lord comes to Moses and He says, I want you to find some men to go explore the land of Canaan. Many of you know this story, you've heard this story before, but it always reminds me that we need to place our trust in Him. So let's take a look at chapter 13, uh, starting in verse 1 through 3. It says this, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's commands... Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were, leading, were leaders of the Israelites. So God tells Moses, I want you to pick a man from each of the tribes of Israel, and they have to be leaders. These are the, the men who lead other people, who are the examples to everyone, the people that everyone listens to from that tribe. Pick one of those people I want you to send them out. And he gives them specific instructions on down in verses 26 uh, or verses 17 through 20. He says this to them. He says he wants them to check out the land. I want you to see what the land is like. What are the people like? What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of town do they live in? Is it unwalled or is it fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees or not? And then he asks them to bring back some fruit. So these men go and they spy out the land. There's 12 of them. They go and they check it out. They're supposed to get this report. And it's, it's very uh, specific on what they're supposed to bring back. So they go out. They gather the fruit. They gather the, things that, the information that they're supposed to. And they make a report of it. And they come back in order to report it to the people and to Moses. In verse 26 through 33, I want to read that to you. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit, but the people who live there are powerful And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. 
Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshopper in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. I think about this situation, and if you think about the Israelites at this time, they're wandering in the desert, and uh, they live in tents. If you think about people that move from place to place, they don't try to acquire a lot of possessions. They don't have a lot. They also don't have fortified cities. And so if you can imagine what it was like for these 12 men to come into these places and look around and see what they saw. They saw places that were huge. They saw people that were bigger than them. They saw fortified cities that seemed like they were incapable of taking. But it's interesting. They report how great the land is. And Caleb tries to stop them and say, we can take this, we can do this. But then they go out and they spread a bad report amongst all the people. Looking at at verse 33, it says that we are like grasshoppers in our own eyes and look the same to them. It's interesting, isn't it? Because grasshoppers are so small, they seem like they're something that can't do anything. But the Israelites found out that That was quite different. If you read the book of Joel, you'll know that locusts came in and destroyed Israel at one point. I was reading through that at the same time I was reading this just with my daily Bible, and I found that so interesting because in their eyes, in their minds, this all seemed completely impossible. This was something that could not be taken, something they could not do, and all they saw was the physical things right there in front of them. But when you think about locusts, you think about the situation and how God used locusts to to destroy Israel at one point and to tear them down, it kind of puts a whole other spin on things, doesn't it? You go on in this story in chapter 14. The people begin to weep and cry aloud. They don't believe that they can take this city. They believe they're going to be destroyed. If you look at verses 5 through 10, it says this, it says, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephna, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them." In verse 10 it goes on, it says, But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. It's so interesting because the people begin weeping. They become very upset. They're very torn up that this, this plan has been put in motion. That they are to go and take on this, these people... But if you remember back, God promised this land to them. He made a promise to them that He would keep His oath and that this would be their land one day. But all of the people did not believe that to the point that they were going to even stone Joshua and Caleb and destroy them. It's later on that Moses tells them from the Lord that they will have to spend another 40 days there, or another 40 years in, in, that, uh, in the desert, wandering around. 
the, be- the people become very upset about that and they decide that they're going to take this land for themselves. Moses warns them, don't go up and do this. God's not with you now. But what do they do? They go up and they try to take the land. So interesting, so many times we try to do things on our own. We try to do the things that are in front of us, the hard things that are right there, the walls that, that are right up in front of us in our life. We try to take those things on by ourselves. But God's right there with us. We need to ask Him to help us. Ask Him for His guidance. Turn over to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua is now in charge. Moses has passed away and Joshua has taken lead over the Israelites. It's been passed on to him. He has been a person who has been being trained in order to take on this position. And over and over and over again, throughout uh, the end of Deuteronomy and Joshua chapter 1, it says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Trust in Him. Put your trust in Him and look to Him for guidance. Joshua is told this over and over and over again. But I think about these Israelites who did what they wanted to do instead of Instead of looking to God, instead of looking to Him for guidance, they saw walls, they saw all these things that the physical said, we can't do it. It's impossible. It's not possible for us to do this. If they would have seen what God was going to do in Joshua chapter 6, if they could have known that, if they would have just trusted Him, how, wouldn't it have been amazing to see? Let, let's take a look at it and see what happens in here. Joshua chapter, five, or chapter 6, three, 3 through 6. This is what God tells Joshua to do. He says, March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horn in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and all the people will go up, every man straight in. Sounds very simple, doesn't it? You look at verse 20, and you see what happens. When the trumpets sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, When the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. It was so simple just to listen to God and do it His way. It wasn't something that was hard. It wasn't something that that took them doing something amazing, because anybody could march around the city, couldn't they? Anybody could blow a trumpet. It might not sound good, but... uh, We could all get out there and march around a city. But you think about the impossible impossible being done. You've never heard about about a crowd screaming loud enough to break down city walls and them collapsing. So many times we try to use science, we try to use physics to figure out things, and we we do that even in the Bible. Uh, I've always heard the, the, the thought, could Jonah have actually survived in a big fish? For three days, is that possible? You think about it, and science scientists have tried to prove this and tried to look at it. And uh, you look at it, and Jonah even says he has seaweed wrapped around his head at one point. It's so silly when we try to ba- to place barriers upon God. God created this world; He created everything in it. He wants what's best for us. He wants what's best for you. He loves each and every one of us and wants to take care of each and every one of us. He's put each of us here to help each other, to love on each other and to care for each other. And I've seen that this week. We're going to have to continue doing that and continue helping people. A lot of people have been placed out of their homes and and are in difficult situations. They're in environments that they haven't been in before and that are very difficult. And we can be there for them. We can help them. There's going to be barriers along the way and hardship along the way. 
But the one thing that we need to do is place our faith in Him. When there's a wall that comes up against you, put your faith in Him. Ask Him for help. Maybe there's something that you need to provide for somebody and you don't know how you're going to do it or what you're going to do. Ask God to help you with that. Ask God to, pl- to provide the things that you need to help that person. Maybe you're the person that's going through those things. Let us help you. Let us as brothers and sisters help you. But more than anything, place your faith in God. Trust Him. That's easy for me to say, I ha- I, I, I'm not in your situation and I, and I know that, so hear me saying that. But I know that that's what God wants from us. He wants us to trust Him. And so that's my lesson for you this morning. Trust Him. Take steps of faith and put your trust in Him. Know that He loves you. Know that He's promised to take care of you. He has a place for each and every single one of us that we will get to go and be together one day with Him. This morning, if you need prayers, we're here as a congregation to offer those up. If, if you're ready to take the Lord on in and to, to, to honor Him with your life, we want to do that too. But we want to be here as a congregation. We want to stand strong and we want to honor Him in all that we do. And so this morning, we're going to offer the invitation. If there's anything we can do for you, please come now as we stand and sing.